Hi, welcome. I'm uh, Paul Cargan. I'm here with Dr. Josh Eiler, Director of Rice University's uh, Center for Teaching Excellence and author of the new blockbuster book on huh. college teaching, How Humans Learn, uh, The Science and Stories Behind Effective College Teaching, which we're going to talk about. Josh, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for the invite, Paul. And thanks for calling to the blockbuster. <laughs> well, if if not, that, that's my impression so far. Um, but if not, it will soon be. <laughs> that's great. Well, let's let's jump right in. Um, a lot of books on college teaching are about how to do it effectively. This this is what works. This is how we know it works. Uh, okay, this is what worked for me. Right. And, in the introduction, you specifically say that that's not what this kind of this book is about. Uh, so on, on page four here, um, you say you want to know why what works works. Mm -hmm. So my my first question is wh why not just tell us what works and be done with it? Why <laughs> go for the why? Right. Well, a couple of reasons. One, because I think we have so many valuable resources already that tell us what works. Um, people far more eloquent than I have laid out uh, in, in uh, nitty gritty detail uh, how to pretty much implement any kind of teaching strategy we could uh, we could think of. You know, I think of books like um, collaborative uh, collaborative learning techniques um, there's you know books like uh, on course by James Lang that really kind of lay out in detail what we should be doing and so that good work is already out there what what I, and and I've learned a lot from it but what was really driving me was why do those things work I mean yes I believe it because uh, you know uh, there's a lot of evidence. If you take something like peer instruction, and uh, which is um, you know a dominant STEM teaching strategy, there's so much research showing just how effective that is. But uh, but what I'm interested in, well, why? Why does that work for students, but something else doesn't? And uh, that is kind of the, the key question that was of interest to me. That it started off as being something that I was just kind of genuinely curious about uh, and it was uh, had a, a pretty big role in the work that I do here at the CTE and so it started off just trying to follow that thread and, and eventually led uh, to this longer project. Like I assume that it's not just personal curiosity that you also think that it would be beneficial for say college teachers to be asking right. the why questions to I do. I do. Um, and so what started, you're right, what started as an individual interest um, quickly blossomed into a kind of framework that I thought would be really valuable uh, to go alongside, almost parallel to uh, the, the other work on kind of teaching strategies. And so uh, what, I, what, I, what I feel strongly about is that if college teachers know more about how students learn, they can do two things. They can um, they can build courses, design courses, and implement teaching strategies that are just simply going to be more effective because they're more attuned to the way we naturally learn. And the second thing that I think, and this is kind of looking toward the future of higher education, that if we have a if if we use what we know, what researchers have been showing us for many decades now about the way human beings learn, we can design new strategies going forward that are consistent with those principles. And I think uh, it serves as a kind of inoculation against educational fads that keep coming down the pipe that you can evaluate, uh, you can evaluate what's new as well as to how, how carefully it matches up with, uh, you know, these principles from, from science. I, I love it. Um, it it's it's uh, it sounds both practical and a modeling of what your first chapter is about. It's just this curiosity. Um, so I, I, my next question is a bit of a, a follow up. Sure. Uh, in addition to you asking why why does this work the why questions, um, which you ask in the introduction and and throughout the book, you're like we know this happens because of such and such research, but why why does it happen that way? Um, you stress you stress ask, having students ask why, asking students why in whatever the subject is. Um, 
So on, on page 46, for example, uh, you're talking about leading class discussions um, and, you, and, and, and suggest moving towards more open-ended questions. Um, you say one way to shift from closed to open is to move deliberately from asking who, what, where, when questions and then shift instead to why questions, questions that really delve into the significance of the issue, uh, the issues that the class is addressing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really like this notion of pushing students too to ask the deeper why questions. But I, I wonder if you might elaborate a little more. What does the why do for students when we ask them why or get them asking why? Right, yeah. Uh, I think it does a couple of things um, actually. And the first and maybe the most important in keeping with the, the larger kind of argument of the book uh, one thing that developmental psychologists have shown really clearly is that from our earliest years, those sorts of in, uh, uh, those sorts of questions that derive from the why uh, are natural mechanisms for cognitive development. And so, um, the one of the researchers I cite in there, and I'm just kind of fascinated with her work, uh, Michelle Schoenard, um, She uh, she's looking at not just the numbers of questions that little kids ask, uh, because a lot of people have done that, but the structure of their questions and was able to observe this, this movement, even in the youngest children from fact-finding question to uh, more um, questions of applications, curiosity, the why questions. And so this, uh, what she was able to then locate is that somehow our development as thinkers uh, our intellectual and cognitive development is rooted, is, is anchored to that why question. And so just from a basic level, if we're asking students to do that work, we are uh, we're aligning um, our, our discussions and our assignments with the, the, the ways that uh, their, uh, their, well, with their basic learning mechanisms, right? Um, but it's more than that then. I mean, that's kind of the fundamental premise that they're simply going to learn more because we're matching up our work with uh, the way people naturally learn. But uh, w questions about why allow them to engage uh, at, a, at a level with the material um, in a deeper way than we normally ask students to, I think. Um, there's there's an engagement, there's a, a, a uh, element of them being able to kind of connect with personal interests. There's the broader application uh, uh, that we're uh, we're asking them to do, and I think then most importantly, they get to see the bigger picture. This isn't all theoretical. It's not academic. It's uh, that there's um, there's a, a way that uh, speaking the why actually puts things into a much larger context for them. I I love that. Um, my, my next question, um, on page seven, I think you state what is um, probably the most surprising um, assertion of, of the book. Okay. Um, most striking and, and I think surprising to a lot of people, uh, which is that humans are more alike than different in, in how we learn. Um, you, you, you say this is very much a book about the deep-seated commonalities that human beings share with respect to learning. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me more about that. Right. Yeah, and you know, I wanted to, I wanted to be very careful um, in framing that, so that I wasn't somehow trying to elide uh, the, the, our diversity and our differences, but, uh, but that to really make headway on teaching and learning questions, we also had to recognize that there's something fundamentally similar about the way uh, the way people approach material and approach questions and 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 seek to know more. And that that was kind of a if we if we knew more about that, we could have a foundation that we could build everything else on. And it would also allow us to then make adjustments for the natural diversity we see in our, our classes because we would because we we have a broader vision of the landscape that kind of joins us together. Um, and uh, I wanted to stress the commonality in the book because I don't think we talk about that that area enough. Uh, actually, that um, there's attention paid to 
uh, how do how do students learn in this particular environment or this particular course or will X strategy work in Y environment? Um, but uh, this was really more of a book about the bird's eye view, and well, let's um, let's really uh, human learning from a, a, a wider lens uh, perspective before we drill down into individual classrooms and, and courses and students. I'm I'm thinking about how to, to kind of building on what you just said, the understanding of the commonalities can help us also navigate the differences. So for instance, um, in a situation where their stereotype uh, threat is, is operating, right. the commonality is that say in a math course, and there's a stereotype that, that women are, are not as good as math and women uh, who are students in the class who are aware of that stereotype have to spend some extra energy worrying about whether they'll confirm that or, or thinking about how they don't believe that or maybe wondering if it's true and that causes them to do more poorly. And that's often seen as a difference between different learners in a classroom. But what's, what's the same is we all have to feel safe yes. in order to perform well. Yes. And there's a, there's a danger that's only hurting or only affecting hurting some people. Uh, but the, the reason that it's a problem is rooted in this deeper deeper thing that we all share. Right. Exactly. So we get a better, uh, in your example, we get a better understanding of not only how stereotype threat is operating, but the dangers of it. If we first understand that people need to feel psychologically safe in order to learn most effectively, and also uh, people need to have, um, adequate's not the right word, uh, need, to, need to be balancing uh, less cognitive load in order to manage uh, these kind of cognitive tasks more effectively. And what we know about stereotype threat from, you know, the, the great research that's been done on it is that one of the reasons it's so pernicious and has such a, um, even, um, it has an effect on academic performance even when people aren't consciously thinking about it is because it's, it's taking up cognitive space, it's using up cognitive load that uh, those students could otherwise be using to perform uh, maximally on those on those exams, for instance. And, and the deeper commonality is we all only have so much space cognitively at any one moment. Right, exactly. Um, what, one thing that you say in the book that I just love on 129, um, you say from from uh, the research on positive emotions and learning mm -hmm. reveals that the single most important strategy we can use to help our st students to succeed in our courses is to care about them as learners and as human beings. Yes, um, that 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 that's powerful because um, some days that's feel I, as a teacher that's self. All I feel I have to offer. Maybe I'm exhausted. Maybe I'm distracted. I didn't get the lesson plan done, but I can show up and, and care. So I, I love I love that, um, and I and I want to make a habit of it of caring. That is not not showing up with only caring. <laughs> right, right. But how how is caring so powerful that you call it the single most effective strategy? Right. It. Uh, yeah. Um, I wouldn't. I mean. Uh, I, thought for a long time uh, about how central empathy is for good teaching. I wouldn't have expected to find, uh, and this was one of the joys of writing the book, for example, I learned so much. Uh, and so some, and some of it violated uh, my expectations. And this was one of them. I wouldn't have expected to find so much about what those researchers call the pedagogy of care uh, and, and, and just how central it is. But, um, that piece of it aside, that chapter on emotion shows uh, just how central emotional engagement is with uh, the work that students do in class. And if we can engage them emotionally, just at a, a fundamental level, it that will allow them avenues into the material that in many ways nothing else will. Right, connecting with them at that level, I think, um, builds uh, builds inroads into into our courses, into the material. The piece about care then comes out of that, 
And um, what the research shows uh, about that, and this was surprising to me, but delightful at the same time, uh, that um, when students believe that the person teaching them, the person in the teaching role, and it's not always a teacher, it's a parent, coach, clergy, whatever, uh, that when the person in the teaching role cares about who they are, they're, uh, they're this balance that uh, that we are always have going on between our emotions and our cognition is kind of in, in perfect harmony at that point. Uh, and they uh, that fundamental connection allows them then to be able to, um, uh, I think, maximize their learning in the course. Um, now, why is that? I think it's, um, it's something that we're often uh, – sort of connecting with unconsciously. The, uh, the, uh, and the story that I tell at the beginning of that chapter of about emotion was my, one of my own teachers in high school and uh, how uh, some of his responses to me simply uh, allowed me to feel like the person who was teaching me actually cared about me. And because of that, I was paying more attention. I, I spent more time on the work because it felt like it mattered in a very different kind of way. And I think, I think at, at a base level, that's what students are responding to when they know that the instructor cares about, their, cares about them as human beings, that it, the work then matters in a different sort of way because it establishes a relationship that goes beyond uh, conveying information to another person and evaluating that person, but that learning and education is a, is, an integral part of our lives and who we are, and that the teacher who cares becomes a linchpin in making that connection. I, I love that. Um, at the beginning of the chapter on authenticity, mm -hmm. you tell the story of Donna Boyd's introduction to forensic anthropology course that you, you visited one day. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's it's just amazing. So you you walk in, the students walk in, and there is a real skeleton right. that she was, was belongs to a murder victim whose mm -hmm. whose murder the uh, Dr. Boyd solved. Right. And, and then she walks the students through the process of examining the bones and and in effect solving the same case themselves. Right. But amazing. It, is. it was it was amazing to watch and um uh and she was she was just yeah fantastic um as she did that i i th that leads me to to just be curious about what did by flying around the country and visiting and observing teachers which is also something that, that you do as part of your your mm -hmm. job at the center um there at rice what 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 did you learn by watching teachers that you didn't couldn't have learned just in doing the research? Right. Um, yeah, you know, one of the reasons I love this job and by extension loved writing the book is uh, you get the opportunity to uh, inhabit disciplines that uh, you're not trained in. That um, you get to see uh, you get to see brilliant teachers interact with students in, in very different contexts than I had as you know an English major and later an English professor. Um, so that uh, that is something you can't learn from a book and you can't uh, you can't learn from the research is actually seeing it happen, seeing the live uh, interactions in the classroom, the kind of the you know, the, the sort of brilliant improvisation that happens when a student asks an unexpected question, uh, to see the, the different strategies instructors will come up with on the fly when they are observing students might not be, uh, might not be grasping the angle that they're pursuing, so they have to shift. Um, and just uh, the, the other element that you can't get from uh, just reading papers about teaching, but that was very palpable in that class was just the energy of a group of people pursuing a question uh, and, and, and trying to put the pieces together to figure it out. And that's, uh, I mean, 
you know this from your work in the classroom. That's something that, <laughs> I mean, it's, you, you either are in the moment and experience that or you're not. And it's, uh, I think it's one of the things that um, really drives me as a teacher, that, that energy, and that, that community uh, of, of, of thinkers in the, in the space at, at the same time. So um, getting to see that in a, a wide variety of different uh, courses and, and different uh, disciplines, different departments, um, that, give, that, that has always given me um, unique, uh, I think, windows into uh, different elements of teaching. And so um, it's also, uh, you know, um, things about writing this book was that I had to, it, it took me five years because I had to spend so much time in disciplines I was unfamiliar with, kind of learning the ropes, learning the methods, learning the vocabulary, uh, learning um, learning how to uh, do a, a, at least a, a rudimentary interpretation of results. And um, in many ways, I was kind of in a position then <clears throat> of an introductory or a student in an introductory course that I didn't have the frameworks of knowledge. I had to, I had to build them. And that's the way it is when you go into classrooms um, like the ones that I was in and, and you don't have uh, the kind of, um, you don't have the background or the experience in the discipline, but what you're watching are the, the teaching behaviors and teaching strategies at play. So that I felt really strongly had to be a complement to the research that I was doing. It had to be it had to be meaningful and it had to be useful. Uh, and 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 I felt like folks had to be able to see the implementation of the research in the in the teaching situations themselves. I um I've realized just recently that uh, I went and observed some of my fellow literature colleagues teaching mm -hmm. um i have i have observed people teach and of course i went through school and, and saw my teachers teach but this isn't this is not really built in uh, as a habit in higher education for professors to watch each other teach right. even in, across disciplines like you're describing or, or even in the same discipline unless there's some kind of supervisory role and i and i watch one of my colleagues teach who I've worked with for 10 years and I realized this was the first time I had ever seen her teach um, and, and so just seeing realizing that and then seeing you go around and, and observe all these teachers seemed like this was maybe something we should encourage professors to do more definitely I mean I think that one of the you know if you had to if you had to kind of try to identify the most effective ways to improve as a teacher, high up on that list would be watching other people teach. Um, and uh, both through just the observation itself and using that as a reflective tool on your own practice, but then also the conversation that unfolds with the person you're watching and asking questions about why they chose to do something and, and uh, how, did, how did a particular strategy evolve over time. And um, those, I, I think those are absolutely um, critical components of, of developing as a teacher. And so, yes, I, I, I mean, I wish, uh, I, some institutions do it well, but um, I think there's a, a, still a lot of work to do to get um, cali a, a formative kinds of peer observations. I mean, there, there are definitely institutions out there that are doing summative peer evaluations of teaching for promotion and tenure and things like that. But um, this is some, what you're talking about, Paul, and what, and, and what I've been doing uh, for the book is something very different. It's uh, the, the kind of formative observation that allows us to improve in a kind of low stakes way that we're just trying to be better teachers and, and, and want, to, uh, want to try and pursue that goal in a variety of forms. And our colleagues are amazing resources of teaching knowledge. Uh, my my next question, it seems like I've lost the page number, uh, but I wrote down what you said, uh, which is that as, as we become adults, the framework put in place when we were younger becomes increasingly vital for successful learning to occur. And at, at that moment, you're talking about handling emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a principle that, that pops up at, at a number of times. Uh, in, in the chapter on sociality, you, you talk about the lingering effects of a playful childhood. 
Okay. So, so recognizing the importance of what, what is put in place very young gets me wondering, is it too late sometimes then for students, college students who haven't uh, say develop that curiosity or, or ability to regulate emotions or, or certain things that, that you're talking about as benefits. Right. Is, is there, are there some hard limits to what we can do by the time students are college age? A really great question, Paul. I don't think it's too late, but I think it's harder um, if a student has um, uh, in their past encountered challenges or obstacles to some of those, um, I think it's fair to call them developmental milestones because I think that's what um, psychologists would call them. Um, uh, and so I, I do think it's hard. Curiosity is actually a, an interesting test case for this because of the educational systems that we've set up in America um, to kind of uh, the, the privilege uh, standardized testing and and hitting hitting the bars that you hitting the marks that you have to hit in order to move to the next grade and so that is not that environment overall is not conducive in any way to uh, fostering students natural curiosity and um, uh, allowing them to be in environments where they feel comfortable taking intellectual risks, which is what we hope kind of the outcome of curiosity is. Wow, I'm fascinated by that. Here, let me just pursue that avenue, uh, even if it uh, even if it hits a dead end. I just want to I want to see what happens. And there's not a lot of room for that in systems where students feel pressure to get great, uh, you know, the right grades to get to the next step and and to um, where the curriculum is driven largely by standards and testing, um, it, it's hard. And I think that, you know, we have some heroic K-12 teachers who are doing their best within that environment to still help our students. I mean, I had some of those teachers as well that, that identified something that they could tell I was passionate about and really let me kind of roll with it a little bit. But um, I, the, so it's not... Um, and you and the reason I bring up teachers is because you'll read a lot of stuff that blames teachers for this, and I don't think that's fair. Uh, certainly, there are probably some who who could be doing a better job, but there's so many other factors that go into that. And and as you're pointing out, the the students' experience in childhood is a big part of that. The educational environments, um, the, the the environment at home, all sorts of things kind of go into that. But if a student has hit a roadblock somewhere along the way, it's not, I think, that they can't, uh, that we can't utilize that curiosity, but uh, we'll have to pay really close attention to the kinds of assignments we're designing. We have to work harder, I think, to create those environments um, and, and actually pursue it from a number of different angles in order to help them. So, I'm imagining you diving into all this research. Uh, you said it took took five years and how, how people learn and why that works. Um, and now you've got to try to organize what you're finding for your readers. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious at, at what point in the in the process did you decide on the, the five topics that structure the chapters of, of your book? You curiosity, sociality, emotion, authenticity, and failure. Uh, and did, did any of these categories surprise you? Were, were there other ones you were thinking of including, but then then left out? So I just, the, the process of, of settling on those five. Right, yeah. Um, failure was the biggest surprise to me. And uh, honestly, um, I settled on those only after uh, after a while in the midst of the reading. They tended to be what, what, what kept coming up uh, to the top, um, to the surface. Uh, over and over again, um, and I wouldn't have anticipated uh, large. I mean, I certainly uh, was thinking about, you know, I had grades and motivation and performance and all that swirling around in my head. But there's you know, there's this whole um, this whole subset now of research that's talking about utilizing error and utilizing difficulty and failure, and so that that really started to um, to bubble up in ways that I hadn't expected from the outset. Um, so these were the topics that just emerged over time. 
I the the I think the the bigger inflection point was I for probably the first year and a half I had in mind that I was going to talk about uh, talk about it in terms of a discipline. Uh, so it's going to have a chapter on the evolution of learning, a chapter on uh, on um, how we can learn about college students from focusing on children, that kind of thing. But I just I couldn't make that structure, that organization as you're talking about. I couldn't make it work for me because every time I tried to contain it in one chapter, I would be I, I would be thinking about another topic and realize that 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 they kind of bled into each other. So I at that that was the point when I said well, maybe I, I have to reorient things and organize around topic rather than around disciplinary perspective. So that was the that was the big thing, and then after I kind of um, thought about that more, then the these these were the categories that naturally emerged. Since you say that failure was the the surprise, I want to I want to ask you about that. I've mm -hmm. often heard failure described as an as an opportunity to learn. Right. But on on one eighty, you 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 actually describe it some beyond that, something more specific. Um, as a as a tool for learning, mm -hmm. um, and so so the the difference seems to be like um, the difference between saying, "Well, you failed, so learn from it," and and more like saying, "So you want to learn? Here are the tools available to you. Among them, failure." Right. So how how is that so that 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 mm -hmm. failure might actually be not just okay a chance to learn, but a tool for learning? Right, and I actually, yeah, and I, I think it's in some ways essential for learning. Um, the what's what what interested me about this topic is that, you know, as as academics, as as, as scholars, it is not in any way um, in opposition to our work to think of failure as a learning opportunity. I mean that. Uh, we run into we run into dead ends all the time and have to have to learn from those mistakes or or just the uh, just you know the the lead that fizzled out and you know scientists don't walk into labs and magically come up with the the answer to their questions it's a long process and so I think uh, by virtue of 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 being positioned in our careers. Uh, and this is true of many careers as well. We see the opportunity in failure. Oh, that didn't work, uh, but I learned a really important lesson, so now I'll, I'll use that and try something else. Um, but where I think it becomes a tool is that uh, higher education is not set up to privilege those opportunities uh, or to teach students that these are valuable opportunities. Um, and so where it becomes a tool is that we can design courses and assignments that allow for students to see the value of, of failure and error. So we can we can use it as a tool uh, to help them uh, kind of experience the learning benefits, right? Um, so uh, that that's everything from uh, lowering the stakes, you know, giving them multiple opportunities to try something out. Uh, it means uh, privileging feedback rather than grades. Uh, kind of iterative process, formative feedback. Um, and by doing that, we are utilizing failure as a tool for learning and, and helping students do the same. And I think the the tool uh, then yields to the opportunity. Um, uh, and, and so as they kind of reorient their relationship with failure, they uh, we help them to see and create environments in which they can uh, they can kind of find the the possibility in making a mistake. Um, I did get some good feedback as I was writing that chapter, and uh, subsequently, kind of as the book was unfolding, what kind of failure was I talking about? And so people were uh, had really powerful and legitimate questions about whether I was suggesting. Uh, that students uh, could just fail whole courses, and that, that we should give, we should frame those that as learning opportunities. And certainly, I think you would learn something if you failed a course about what not to do. But it's also a really privileged position to take to suggest that people can just randomly fail courses, and that we should we should cavalierly suggest 
that, uh, oh, it's just a learning opportunity because certainly some students can afford to fail. Uh, to, uh, they can afford to be in that situation more so than other students. So what I'm talking about is kind of a spectrum of failure from making basic mistakes up through conceptual or, or misconceptions um, that affect their learning within the scope of a course. How can we use that uh, to, to help them learn more effectively? I, um, I, um, so I have an assignment that I think fits in that. So I would just run it by you and see if you're seeing it the same way. So I have in my, it's a first year writing course, one of the first courses students take. Um, and I assume that they don't know how to read uh, nonfiction book length works kind of deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, do, I have an assignment I call the deep reading experiment. Uh, at, that, that has a part one is I assign them the book and I tell them to read it and however they normally read mm -hmm. and to note how they're reading it. And I, I don't give them a lot of time because I assume that normally they wouldn't put a lot of time into reading. Um, and then part two of the experiment, we reread that same book uh, and, I, and I, I give them a lot of support on how to read deeply, how to take notes, how to ask questions, how to, how to find other texts that illuminate the text. We watch a documentary about the author. Um, and then the third part is just to compare the two experiences. Hmm. That's a great idea. So is that, is that, that first part is kind of a, a planned, controlled, no stakes failure, because most of them don't read it as richly as they do the second time. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Um, that's exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. And I think there are analogous assignments in, in any discipline, really. But yes, now, um, so that provides a perfect environment for them to try something out uh, and get feedback on where they may need to fill in some of those gaps. And then you bring in this other, uh, these other two parts that then help them utilize the, the, potential, uh, the potential failure of the first part in order to, to learn and help them in the rest of the course. So, yeah, I think that's great. Um, and I, the, the challenge, the real, there are a couple of real challenges, I think. Uh, and I see that chapter as the very tip of an iceberg of a conversation that needs to, that needs to happen over, over the next uh, few years. And that is that, um, there are two big challenges. One is uh, students are not, this is not um, something that they would have experienced in other educational contexts. And so we have to help students figure out how to learn from failure and prepare them for that. Or we're, uh, you know, we're going to run into, uh, we're going to run into some roadblocks, and they'll be frustrated. And so then, uh, you know, we're back to the emotion chapter as well. Um, uh, but the other big uh, obstacle, and this uh, no one teacher can undo, is the fact that we have to give grades in higher education right now. And so. Um, we can utilize alternative models like ungrading and contract grading and lots of great things out there. Uh, but eventually we have to give a grade that still evaluates that. And so in some ways it's, it undermines uh, efforts to utilize failure in this way. But I think we can at least give students uh, the framework or the architecture to be able to approach learning um, from a model that, that utilizes the learning benefits of failure. So by training, you're, you're a humanist, right. you're a medievalist literary scholar. And this book, you, you dive deeply into a wide range of, of hard sciences. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm wondering, how do you know that you're understanding and representing the science uh, correctly, especially when it comes to debates that the scientists themselves have not fully adjudicated? Right. Um, and, and I and I ask this not because I doubt you, but <laughs> if a scientist were to come and summarize right. large swaths of humanity research, I'd be I'd be a little skeptical. Right. So I, I I was just wondering what you what you thought about that. Yeah, that's in some ways that's the question at the heart of all this. Um, you know, uh, uh, so uh, putting putting aside the the time that I spent just trying to immerse myself. Um, uh, a couple of things. Um, 
One is that it was really important to me to uh, that what I said would be credible with scientists. That uh, they didn't have to they didn't have to agree with me. That would be a whole different thing, right? But uh, they at least had to say, okay, uh, you know, there, there's uh, that's a va- that's a valid way of kind of interpreting the evidence. Um, so that was really important to me. That's why I kind of. Uh, spend so much time getting a handle on methods and, and results and things like that. Um, the other uh, the other piece of that though was I have really amazing scientist colleagues here and elsewhere that I would ask questions. I would say, okay, I just read this. Uh, here's kind of what I'm thinking uh, as it might apply to learning. Do you think I'm on the right track? And so I got really great feedback from them. Um, and sometimes they'd say no back to the drawing board. And sometimes they would say, uh, yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. Um, and, and so, uh, pursue that. And so one, um, one really quick example of this was that for a long, for a long time, there was this way of, um, uh, discussing rhetorically the evolution of the brain that divided it into three parts. They called it the triune brain, the reptilian brain, the mammalian brain, and the human brain. And so essentially it was it was uh, trying to suggest which uh, which parts are more evolutionarily conserved, which, uh, which, uh, which parts of our brain and the functions of those we share with um, with other animals over time. And it's been disproven, but it's a really, it's a really attractive, um, it's a really attractive model when you're first trying to get your feet wet and understanding these things. And so that was a question I brought to uh, my friend, Scott Solomon, who's an evolutionary biologist here. And I said, is this how people still think about this? And uh, he said only a little bit. And then he, uh, he kind of uh, helped me see the, uh, the newer models and what was, uh, I think, interesting about the old models, but where people had uh, had gone from there. And so uh, very lucky to have uh, people that I could bounce these ideas off of. But then the third thing I want to say, though, is that I actually relied pretty heavily on my training in the humanities to help with this. And, you know, one of our bread and butter skills is close reading and synthesis. And so that really, uh, that really was a benefit in a project like this. Um, closely reading the research and being able to make connections across uh, different disciplines. And I think uh, one of the reasons I was able to do that it, to the degree that, I, that it's successfully done in the book is because of my training in the humanities. And another reason was I didn't really have a horse in the race. You know, I'm not a psychologist, so I wasn't privileging the psychological, not a biologist, so I wasn't privileging that. I was just able to look at commonality again and see where, uh, see where I could um, make connections. Uh, the, the part of your question about um, uh, kind of analyzing or, or going through broad swaths of research, uh, the, the ultimately where I landed was to not come down on one side or another of a particular scholarly controversy, but to say, here are the three ways that people have, uh, the, the sociology chapter is a good example of this. There are heated debates about which came first, uh, gesture or language, and, or did they co-evolve? Those are kind of the three ways to look at it in in broad uh, in broad brush strokes. And so I didn't come down on either any side. I, I just kind of presented uh, the evidence and said, well, you know, no matter which came first, they're still intimately connected. And so was able to kind of take take the controversies and the and the debates as a launching pad rather than. Um, rather than trying to make my case for one of those things. That, that you've convinced me. Um, oh, what, one of the last things I want to ask you about is you, you teach a Pixar course, a course on Pixar films. Sounds fascinating. Can, can you tell me a little bit about that course and about how maybe some of the principles of, that, that show up in the book show up in the course? Right, yeah, um, it's a fun course to teach. Um, uh, it, it started with a, 
you know, a, a, a random thing that was shared on social media about, I don't know, five or so years ago. There's a, there's a writer named John Negroni who wrote a blog post called The Pixar Theory, uh, I think in 2013. And it was an effort to uh, argue that all of the films are part of the same universe. Uh, and it, I don't actually think that's true, but I, it was intriguing enough to me to see uh, the films working together as a body of work and to uh, to think about uh, them in kind of richer, more nuanced ways than I had at that point. I thought, well, this could be, this could be a fun course to teach. Um, and so where uh, I've taught it twice now, and as, it, as it's changed, uh, or it has changed as I was writing the book, and a couple of those ways, uh, uh, one is the grading, uh, I grade the course on the portfolio model now, and so the only thing that gets the grade is the final portfolio, and there's unlimited revisions and opportunities for feedback. So that shifted from more of a traditional, um, more of a traditional drafting model. They would write the first draft, I would comment on it, and they'd hand in a, 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 a more revised draft. Um, the other way I think that it, it, it works, and I've tried to put these principles into practice, is students, uh, well, the, the students that we're teaching now are in the age group where they grew up with most of those films. Now, some of the early ones are before their time, Toy Story, Toy Story 2, uh, but, uh, but most of the kind of core Pixar films that, that we think about, uh, they were kids and grew up with them. And so they had these kind of deep emotional connections with those films in the same way we might with uh, some of the movies we watched when we were kids. Um, and that translates into kind of immediate engagement with the material. And then you can take that enthusiasm and excitement and that emotional connection and you can build on it to, uh, to do the kind of um, uh, more nuanced intellectual work that we, would, uh, that we would expect with texts in a college level course. And so that, that's been really interesting to see. And, um, but where the book comes in, I mean, obviously the course from the outset, I, had, I kind of had that in mind, but where the book fits in is that I, I've really opened up to um, even more so than I had been in the past to them following those kind of threads from their childhood. Like I loved, uh, I, I can, there are several students who just love, uh, they love Wally uh, and for uh, very personal kinds of reasons and kind of let them explore that terrain and build, build, uh, the sort of um, the interpretive or argumentative work out of it and really try to honor their responses to those movies as people and, and as the kids they once were and then kind of try and do the work out of that. I, I love it. Uh, uh, the, the last thing I just want to ask you is if there's, there's anything else that you want to say that I haven't asked you about. Well, this, these have been some great questions, um, and I really, I always appreciate the, this kind of uh, engagement. Uh, I think that's the ultimate um, compliment for a writer to have someone engage with the ideas at this level, Paul. So I just really appreciate your, your response to the book and inviting me to take part in this conversation. Well, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for writing the book. Uh, I guess I guess that's all I have. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. All right. So long.